And welcome back to some sort of the Cooler Jets podcast for us, Ben Blessington and no Michael Nania this week. The first time I think in the history of this pod, he is already in Vegas. And I think he's wow. been on a 72 hour uh, binge <laughs> of hookers, gambling and drugs since that Monday night loss to the Chargers. So he will not be joining us this week, but he will be on the post game pod uh, in his place. We brought on Marcus Johnson, who we had on for a Greg Olson pod, I think, in January and then a Derek yeah. Carr review. And you were uh-huh. awesome, man. Um, and as we were we were just talking like right before we got on, I'm like, what a whirlwind it's been since the last time we spoke from yeah. not getting car, getting Rogers, the Rogers injury, you guys firing McDaniels. And now both these teams meet in prime time Sunday night football. I don't know how this game didn't get flexed out, but no four and four versus four and five, two teams kind of in a similar spot. And this kind of feels like a make or break week, especially for the Jets. Uh, yeah. But also for the Raiders. I mean, second game outside of uh, after firing McDaniels, obviously last week, blowing, blowing out the Giants. And then yeah. you see that typically with like interim coaches, that first game, there's like a big emotional uh, like release and they, they come out hot and they usually play pretty well that first game. And then it's, can they sustain it? And it's like, uh, this is a second week. So it's not, it's not the full season. It's still early in, in Pierce's tenure. It's prime time. They're at home and they're playing a terrible Jets offense. So, yeah. It's kind of a scary matchup for the Jets. On paper, you look at this Raiders team, it's like, okay, the Jets should win this. But then you're like, oh, man, this this Jets offense is completely unreliable. So all that yeah. said, Marcus, first, how are you doing, man? And then we'll, we'll hop into this this Jets-Raiders preview. I have no idea how long this pod will be. We're missing the A side of this pod, so I don't know who's <laughs> going to okay. bring the stats. <laughs> it's okay, man. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm doing pretty good, man. Uh, you know, just the, covering the Raiders, man, it's been a, a whirlwind. You know, it's been – such a difference since they, since Josh McDaniels has been out and you kind of could tell that they're just tired of him just watching it on film myself. So it, it's been a big change uh, with moving on from McDaniels. Yeah. I mean, we've, we kind of had a similar thing. The Jets never fired Gase mid season, but I, I just going through and reading a bunch of Raiders articles this week and even just watching the film and seeing the players, it's kind of reminiscent of like Jets fans when they finally got rid of Gase, we didn't have the in season uh, game to see the, the impact of it. But just reading Raiders fans, they are happy this guy is gone. So I guess yeah. what were the biggest differences in, schematically in that first game? They fired not just McDaniels, but the OC and the GM, which mm-hmm. a lot of turnover. Specifically, let's just start with the offense. And, and then they started yeah. a rookie, Aiden O'Connell, a fifth-round pick who played pretty well. I mean, he managed the game. He averaged, I think, like eight yards a, an attempt, although all yeah. his completions were, were under 10 yards I was looking at. But he did a yeah. nice job. Um, so – what were the biggest differences just in this first game for, for this Raiders offense? Uh, I think the biggest difference was, you know, they went away from the tendencies that Josh McDaniels has and what off what defenses were ready for. So I think a lot of defenses were kind of just basically knew everything that Josh McDaniels was about to do. And that was kind of half of the that reason. Sounds, that sounds like Nathaniel Hackett. Exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> so defenses knew exactly what Josh, Josh McDaniels wanted to do on third down, especially. Raiders have been terrible on third down since last year. They went into this year. They're terrible on third down once again. And one of those big reasons, because he has these plays that he runs on third down and they get really, really repetitive. And I think they switched it up this, this week, went a lot more short passes on third down, a lot of quick slants, a lot of things that uh, could add up to Yak because they got an accurate quarterback in there. So I think Boy Hardegree did a really good job of mixing it up, especially with the run game too. They went to zone, a lot of zone runs. Josh Jacobs is comfortable there. And, you know, Josh McDaniels is a power guy and he was kind of stubborn there as well. Didn't want to mix it up and get, how to make Josh Jacobs comfortable, and especially they got a smaller offensive line. It didn't really make sense to go pure power like they were. So they went 17 zone runs to nine power runs this past week. So it, it, it was a definitely a huge switch from what Boy Hart agreed, so I guess, saw on film for what the Raiders were doing for their tendencies. And he just went after those and kind of switched it up. So it would be interesting to see how Robert Sala and these guys kind of adjust to what they did last week. And, you know, do the Raiders kind of go back to some of the stuff Josh McDaniels was doing third down to kind of switch it up because he kind of shows some different tendencies. That's what I'm, that's what I'm excited to see. Yeah, I mean, this, this has potential to be a really ugly defensive battle uh, between these two teams, <laughs> especially no Colton Miller, which oh, is man, a huge, yeah. I mean, he's doubtful. So maybe, I mean, maybe he comes through and plays, but it doesn't yeah. seem like he's going to play. And that's especially against this Jets defensive line and Bryce Huff. I mean, that seems like a huge loss for this, this Raiders offensive line. You mentioned Jacobs. He's had a tough season, but then last week he finally looked like the Josh Jacobs of old. You yeah. mentioned the, the switch from, from gap runs to zone runs. I guess when you look at this Jets defense and anybody who's listened to this podcast or really has just watched this Jets defense knows the weakness of this Jets defense, although there's there's not many. I've said mm-hmm. this sentence 50 times in this podcast, but it's the teams that just take uh, advantage of the over-aggressive fronts and use yeah. the trap runs, the draw runs, the screens. And 
a quarterback who has to be able to be willing to take the stuff that's underneath um, because the Jets are going to play that shell coverage and they're going to take away the, the deep shots. And yeah. so O'Connell, like if he's willing to just take those three yard completions and try to set up some yak and just keep methodically moving down the, the field and trying to get that running game open, that's the only way I see this, this Raiders offense having any success, but the loss of Colton Miller, that's, that's massive. So w- what is this Raiders offensive line going to look like you think on, on Sunday night? So, I mean, if they don't have Colt Miller, so it's probably going to be Illuminor at left tackle and then Mumford at right tackle. That would be my guess. They're going to move Illuminor over to the left and Mumford over to right. I think, you know, Mumford's a pretty solid young right tackle, in my opinion. He, he can get beat, um, but I, I think he, he will hold his own. And he does definitely does his, uh, a lot better in the run game, too, I think, than Illuminor does on the right side. He's pretty athletic for being how big he is. He's about 330 pounds. Pretty, he can move especially when they run those crack tosses, he can get around there pretty quickly and, and, and maul some people. So Mumford, he'll he'll do solid, but he's going to get beat. Illuminar, he's actually a pretty good tackle himself when it comes to pass protection. So it's going to be interesting to see how he does on the left side because I don't think he's – I don't know if he's ever played on the left side. Maybe. I'm not sure. But – um, Bryce Huff is just licking his chops hearing that. Yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, Illumina will hold his own against Bryce Huff. I mean, but he'll get beat too. So those are two guys that I know they're going to get beat eventually in that game. Cause they're not perfect. They're not quote Miller. Even if they have some solid reps in between those getting beat, they're going to get beat. And, you know, and even the guys inside, I know you guys are familiar with Greg Van Roten. who's actually having a big I, year. I know. I was like, yeah. what? Where was this guy in 2019 and 2020? He's like, he's good now. This Raiders O line's actually statistically been pretty good, and I was like, "Yeah, hey, yeah, your starting guard." <laughs> yeah, makes no sense. I, I thought I, did, I thought he'd be like at least okay and better than Alex Bars, but he's actually overachieved in pass protection. He's been terrible in the run game. Though. He's okay. awful. That sounds like game. him. Yeah, yeah, awful. But in the pass protection, he's actually been pretty damn good. And Dylan Parham is pretty good. And Andre James, he's iffy in the inside. So I think they'll have a game plan for Quentin Williams, and they'll they'll try to they'll try to mix it up. I think we'll probably have to do some more chipping this week. There's probably right. gonna be a lot of chipping, a lot of, a lot of those things and, you know, dumping the ball off to Michael Mayer after a chip and those type of things are going to be happening because I don't expect them to just leave those guys in the Island. Like, you know, Joshua Daniels is do stuff like that, but I doubt that this week. Yeah, The guy that I was actually really impressed watching the, that Giants game was Andre James. Cause I don't think Dexter Lawrence had a single pressure that entire game. And Lawrence just destroyed the jets when they played him. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, this, this Raiders offensive line with Colton Miller, it would be a pretty formidable opponent for this Jets defensive line. But without Colton Miller, I think, and a, and a young quarterback, and no offense to Aiden O'Connell, who I think played pretty well against the Giants. The yeah. Jets have just played a gauntlet of elite quarterbacks so far this season. So it's, <laughs> it's nice to just be able to play a rookie fifth-round pick um, without his starting left tackle. I do really think this is a game where the Jets defensive line, I mean, they feasted all season. But yeah. I think they can really feast, especially with the stunt packages. I mean, they've gotten more creative with using Jermaine Johnson and moving him all around. Last mm-hmm. week, they were putting him inside. He's amazing at stunts. I have to say that that the stunts that the Jets were running against the Chargers were just fooling uh, Justin Herbert. And I think they had eight sacks. I could be wrong. I might have one. I want to check that. Yeah, <laughs> tons of, tons of yeah but they, they got after him. And so I think that this is a game where the Jets can really frustrate a young quarterback and try to force him into mistakes. And we'll get to the Jets offense in a second. But mm-hmm. the key for the Jets, honestly, has been creating turnovers. That's the only way that this Jets offense has been able to put up any sort of points. And against the young quarterback missing his left tackle, I think that's a that's a good opportunity for them to do this. So from the Raiders' perspective, you're Aiden uh, O'Connell. How are they trying to attack this Jets defense? Are they trying to stay conservative and do what the Jets have done all season long and say, let's just try to let our defense win this game and just run the ball? And if we have to get in a punt fest, that's all right, um, because we trust that maybe Zach Wilson on the other side is going to make a mistake. Or do you think that maybe the, the, the Raiders should – let O'Connell air it out and throw down field and maybe catch this this Jets defense by surprise. He has certainly has the, the weapons outside. Yeah, I, I doubt that though. I think they're gonna try to do exactly what they did last week, which is run the ball a lot. Um, you know, as Jacobs had over 25 carries last week, a lot of running the football and a lot of play action, and then you know, mixing it up on third down, a lot of short passes. Cause I mean, that's what he does really well. Uh, you know, he has some pretty good intermediate balls that were dropped. You know, so I know he didn't have any, some intermediate, intermediate completions, but he had one that was like knocked out of Devontae Adams' hands that he had a pretty good throw. He had another great throw under pressure to Jacoby Myers that he dropped. So, um, you know, I, I think O'Connell can get it done. I, I think after he had that start to the Chargers game, it felt like he just became a different player. Like, it, it, you know, he felt like he was just like, okay, I might never play football again here. So um, let me just go air it out and just ball and just do what I can do. And I think that gave him some confidence. Because he kind of took that from the end of the Chargers game into this game. So I, he'll be able to handle it. I know that. I know he'll be able to handle the pressure. I know he'll be able to handle the moment. 
Um, it's just how he executes the offense. That's that's the kind of thing I want to see. I know he has the toughness. I know he has the grit to do it. I know he has all those things. Nothing's going to get him phased. Even if he does like a fumble and the Jets end up getting some points off of it, he's going to come back and keep firing. I know he has that in him. It's just can he get it done, execute it, because he can't move that much and all those things, and he's got to deal with a lot of pressure. Let's see how he gets rid of the football if he knows where to go and check it down to. And then on the flip side, I mean – Zach Wilson, this Jets offense has been a bit of a disaster this season. People, I've been a little too defensive, maybe of Zach Wilson. We've watched yeah. the All Twenty Two, and you know, after I watched, I did the the rewatch, and then I watched the condensed game on Monday night before we did our, our last podcast. Hadn't watched the All Twenty Two, and I just kind of felt like, okay, this this is the same Zach Wilson that the Jets have seen since the Chiefs game. Chiefs game aside, he looked like a different guy. He was throwing yeah. downfield aggressively, throwing with anticipation, which really is his biggest issue when you watch the All Twenty Two, which is hard to see from the broadcast angle. Yeah. That's Zach Wilson's number one issue is that he still, like he did in college, waits to see a receiver get open before he throws it. And I think part of that is also being worried about, about turning the ball over. And so one of the things we talked about on, on our last podcast was this Jets offensive philosophy has been too much of trying to stay in third and manageable because they had these games early in the season against the Patriots and the Cowboys where Zach Wilson and this Jets offense is in third and 10, third and 11, third and 12. And it's just the toughest situation for a young quarterback to be in. So they've been really trying to emphasize on short passes, running on second and long, trying to set up these third and fives. And look, the Jets third down offense has been historically bad. So Michael mm -hmm. and I were just saying, you know what? Start taking shots down the field because yeah. you don't have the offensive line and you don't have the quarterback to methodically move 75 yards down the field in 12, 13 play drives multiple times in a game. Your best chance is is getting the ball in the hands of your playmakers and Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson and them creating a big explosive. Uh, ready for this stat? I, I said this last week. The Jets okay. haven't had a single touchdown drive since that Chiefs game. All their touchdowns have been one-play touchdowns. Oh, wow. So it's it's kind of the only way this Jets offense has done anything. It's just a big Brees Hall play. Um, okay. But when I look at this Raiders game, and I was watching the Giants, who were averaging like above five yards of carry, and then the game kind of got out of hand and they had to throw – um, and then I, I was looking at next gen stats and I, I looked at the last three Raiders games and specifically, I mean, the Raiders run defense, I know has been an issue and you, you can speak to that, but specifically to the outside, to the left, I looked at, uh, where, where did I put this? Uh, I put, uh, I'll cut this out. Hold on. Yeah. The side Max Crosby's not on. Is that what you're getting at? No, it was the other side. It was so for, uh, Deontay Foreman <laughs> had seven carries to, to the left outside. He averaged seven yards of carry. He had 50 mm -hmm. total. Uh, Jameer Gibbs had 10 carries outside to the left. He averaged six and a half yards a carry, 65 yards total. And then last week, Barkley averaged 7.4 on, on seven carries. He had 52 yards total. And so the only reason I say that is last week, especially you see this in the L22, the Jets on third down ran a little pitch play to Brees Hall. They motioned yeah. him and then they motioned back a little toss and Beckton was getting out in space. And that was going to be a touchdown. That was going to be the Jets weekly big explosive Brees Hall play. Their one touchdown of the game. And of course, Brees Hall drops the ball and they fumbled it. It was just that type of day for the Jets. Yeah. Um, but Becton will be the left tackle this week. They don't get the Wayne Brown back. And it's kind mm -hmm. of a good good matchup for it. And we'll get into the we do a random prediction at the end of the, the pod. But yeah, I feel I feel good about the Jets having some big runs to the outside to the left. How do you feel about that? And then the, just this Raiders run defense as a whole, which has been kind of porous. But as you said, they do have one of the best defensive players in, in all of football and Max Crosby. Yeah. So because I mean, because most of the time, because Max Crosby, he lines up over the right tackle most of right. the time. Most of the time. And the Raiders, why teams run to the left is because they have Jerry Tillery, who plays on the left side, who's probably the worst defense tackle runner. <laughs> he was getting right. moved off the ball. I was noticing that. They also said they uh, had the yeah. rookie who played kind of well, though. Um, yeah, uh, Tyree Wilson? No, no, no. The in inside. He was like a seventh round uh, rookie. Oh, Nesta. Nesta. Nesta yes. J. Severa. Yeah. And then and I read. Like, Go ahead. I read that article too that kind of broke down. He had a, he had a nice performance, a little bit, you know. He, he yeah. did all right. He did better than, I guess, I guess when Jerry Tillery is what you're comparing him to. He looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah, because because the Bears literally just ran to that side every single time. That's yeah. what they did. They ran to that side every single time. And, you know, the Patriots kind of – they last in the last time they played them last season when they had the Jacoby Myers play or whatever with Chandler Jones, that's what yeah, the Patriots the way, did. That was, that was one of the best moments as, as a Jets fan. I've watched the Patriots just – I'd salivate. I watched that play probably 100 times. Just <laughs> I, can, I can imagine Thank you, Raiders Nation, for that. We're enemies <laughs> this week, but forever. The Raiders Nation will always have a place in my heart just from that play alone. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, but that's what that's what the Patriots did. They ran right at Jerry Tiller. That's all they did. And teams, that's what teams are doing. And it, it makes sense to me because he's an awful run defender. And, you know, the other guys on the other side, you know, Tyree Wilson, he's getting a little better. Malcolm Koontz is not a great run defender. But, uh, you know, so they just – teams are just going to run to that side. They're going to run away from Max Crosby because you run at Max Crosby, you bad things will happen. Like, Jameer Gibbs, Jameer Gibbs was – 
like got thrown like two yards. Especially uh, when he, like Max <laughs> Mitchell is probably going to be your right tackle this week. I mean, we'll get into the past game in a second, but yeah, <laughs> the Jets should not be running routed right at all this week. It should be all to the left. Yeah, yeah, all to the left because I'm telling you, just what Jerry Taylor really lines up, and he just is is awful over there. And then you know they, they play. They used to play Isaac Rochelle, but he didn't play this week. They, they're playing Malik Reed a little bit uh, this past week, um, and it's not working over there, right? And then the linebackers. You know, Spillane's, I guess he has a broken hand, but he hasn't been physical for a while. Um, you know, the only physical linebacker they have is Luke Masterson, who's coming back this week, but he's not a starter. So I don't know how they're going to mix it in. Divine Diablo, he's a safety, converting the linebacker, and that's how he attacks what guards. Name. Like, yeah, like, yeah, Divine, exactly. That's a great name. But that's how he attacks, he attacks linebackers like he's a safety still. So, he, he, you know, I mean, attacks guards or, you know, guys coming up to him in the second level, you know, and they're, they're not physical enough. Uh, or shoot gaps when the guys in front of them do win. So the linebackers are the big are a bigger issue in my opinion than you know kind of running to the left side. Even though Jerry Tillery is an issue because those linebackers they, they're not coming to filling. They're not coming. They're not doing their job. So that's why you're able to run the ball over these guys because the linebackers can't tackle very well. Spillane, uh, you know, he has a huge neck, but he has small arms, I guess, because he gets dragged all the time. And then you know, Divine Diablo is just still learning how to play linebacker basically and. Yeah, so I mean, the best guy, in my opinion, is an undrafted dude from Iowa. So it's it's uh, it's not good at the linebacker position. That's one of the reasons they can't stop the run. But teams are running the left because Jerry Tillery. That's where he lines up. So one of the one of the other things I noticed when I was watching the game is, especially in early downs, the Raiders were running a ton of cover three, and then they would they got a little bit more exotic. They were mixing in the blitzes, but mm-hmm. off of that. Uh, the Giants had an opportunity for a deep ball early in the game off a double move. They had another one that they didn't even throw. I think it might have been the first play of the game where mm-hmm. I think Jalen Hyatt did a little double move on Marcus Peters, got right by him, and it would have been a big play, but I don't think Daniel Jones even threw it. The second yeah. one went out of bounds, and then there was another one too. Um, but there's opportunities for those little double move deep shots. I know Robertson had ended up having a great game. He had a pick. He had a forced fumble. Uh, I was reading an article, I think, on Silver and Black Pride where they're saying kind of the story of, of Amik Robinson's career is he'll give up like a big play early on, and then he'll lock in. I don't know if mm-hmm. you see that, but do you see do you see opportunities for for deep shots for this Jets offense against this, this Raiders defense? Yeah, there is. I, I think what they have to do is kind of just bait these guys a little bit. I think Amik Robinson he likes to take chances. I mean, if you watch that Daniel, same with Marcus Joe, Peters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but I, you know, with Amik, Amik, he, it's, it's funny that Daniel Jones play is he, he saw Daniel Jones start to you know. A throwing motion. I guess he assumed Daniel Jones wasn't throw deep, so he tried to break on it. And the next thing you know, Hyatt's running by him wide open. So that's what Amik Robinson does. He takes a lot of chances, and they got they can, they have chances for get these guys with double moves. I thought it was interesting they played a lot of cover three this this past week because before they were playing mostly quarters, but this past week they played all cover three. And you know these guys around the team are cover three guys. I mean Trayvon Morey is Gus Bradley, Divine Diablo is Gus Bradley, um, Nate Hobbs is Gus Bradley. Um, they they all come from that those guys that's that system of playing cover three and that Seahawks. Yeah, and whatever. that's that's kind of the tree that Sala came off of. Although it's 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 changed since he's you know over yeah. the last few years with him in San Francisco and, and him as the Jets coach. But yeah, I, I, do you think that's something that they'll continue going forward, trying to maximize their guys, or do you think that was a giant specific? Um, I mean, I know it's hard to to predict, but how yeah, do you kind of anticipate them? I I I kind of do. I, I kind of think they're going to go more simple that way. Just because it allows them to play faster, right. uh, but I still there's, there's going to be openings there though. I mean, when you play cover three and you, and you can read it and you have time, there could be openings that you can attack. You know what they're trying to do, and you know they they, they did play a little bit of quarters and some, some of those things, a little bit of cover two, but it was mostly just single high the whole game and mixing it up. And because that, that's where Morig is the best when he's in the range and he's just going back and forth and he's able to come down and make some tackles. And Marcus Epps was able to make some plays too. So um, you know I, I think they'll, they'll probably keep to that in my opinion kind of keep it simple for these guys to you know play zone and something that they're comfortable with but we'll see i mean they have a lot of cover three uh guys that came over from different teams like uh they, they have the chris ash came from the jaguars he was under uh I forgot, I forgot his, he was under gus bradley too and he came from the jaguars so a lot of those guys are cover three guys who come into that that system you know i know robert sala and dan quinn they kind of got away from it a little bit they still play some cover three but not as much as because because bradley's still doing the same damn thing he did in 2011 so <laughs> I mean, it works for him though you hope that you'd hope that if, if <laughs> the only thing i would say is if the raiders do try to run that you'd hope that 
Jeff Ulbrich and Robert Sala who know that scheme so intimately. Yeah. They know exactly how to, to mm-hmm. attack it. And the Jets, they've done it a few times. I'm trying to remember specifically, but with that Yankee concept with the deep over and then the post right behind it, that's one of the few concepts I've seen Zach Wilson kind of hit. The big problem though is like, okay, let's send you, let's say you send Garrett Wilson on, on a, on a post. They don't really have any, but Alan Lazard's a number two receiver and he yeah. doesn't separate and he has at least one bad drop every game. Uh, He's yeah. been their deep over guy. And it does, it does work because they can come out in that, that 12 personnel. They can, they can motion them in, get them next to the tight end. It looks like a run. They'll go play action and try to hit that deep over. And I've seen Zach Wilson do that a couple times, but he's not a separator. And that's really something the Jets are going to have to figure out this Sunday night. You know, you're not going to be familiar with this guy because he's a no name, but perhaps the Jets give more reps to a guy like Malik Taylor, or maybe even a guy like Jason Brownlee, uh, who's Mm -hmm. been inactive every single week. They have to find somebody who can, who can create that separation. Cause Lazard has really been a big problem for this team. You know, he has things that, that, that he does well for this Jets offense, but they got left at the altar in the, in the off season with, with Corey Davis retiring. And that was really something that I think has, has been really detrimental to Zach Wilson in, the, in this Jets offense, which look, Aaron Rodgers went down. The whole thing has gone yeah. to shit, but yeah. that specifically with the receivers, they don't have anybody who can separate outside of Garrett Wilson. So teams just key in on Garrett Wilson and they say, beat us with literally anybody else. And outside mm-hmm. of Brees Hall making one big explosive play every game, this Jets offense has been, completely anemic i don't know if you've gotten a chance how much you've watched the jets at all but yeah. when you, when you see the jets and then you, you know the raiders very intimately how do you think they should try to attack the, this raiders defense you know you know uh i i think that how the jets should attack this raiders defense i mean they, they got to run the ball they got to run the ball i mean that's, that's that's the main thing i think that's how you attack this team i i, I was kind of i thought it was weird the giants really got away from it like when especially with barkley was like getting 10 yards of carry like to start the game and they kept trying to pass it was super weird I especially that, since but... tommy devito didn't throw a single pass against the jets i wonder if that <laughs> was a remnant against uh, i wonder if that's just because he got so much criticism for just only running the ball but then it's like then they play the raiders and that's the matchup where you really do want to run the ball and they start throwing with tommy devito <laughs> who by the way i went to syracuse and that guy was terrible yeah, I, I don't want to slander him too much. I don't want to get sued or anything. There's yeah, some other stuff too. He's <laughs> awful. Hate that guy. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, they, they got to run the ball a lot. Um, you know, and and I think you know with Hackett, it's interesting because you know I was watching his offense, and I was especially watching his Chargers, and I'm thinking, you like, okay, you're playing a cover two, cover five trap team, a team that likes they'll show cover five sometimes. It looks like two man, but the, if you do an out, the guy's gonna stop and take it. And he like, just kept running things into it, and I thought that was. Super weird. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, like, you got to know what coverage you're going to do. So, I mean, he has to attack what the Raiders are doing in the passing game, which I don't know if he does. I don't know if that's something he, not something he really he's does. Consistently he's consistently He's out <laughs> He's, he's literally Adam, Ga- we, we hired Adam Gase again, which was a pay, he was a Peyton Manning merchant, Adam Gase was, and now we have Aaron Rodgers, which this offense was literally just going to be Rodgers get to the line and just audible into whatever concept he wanted. Yeah. And then Hackett looks like a genius. Hackett's two things have literally been Rodgers merchant and then he's, He's trademarked the gold zone. That's his red zone. And the Jets have literally been the worst red zone team, I think, since like the 70s or something. So he's been terrible. His route concepts work. I was watching, um, I think it was a couple Uh, weeks ago, but it was JT O'Sullivan. I don't know how much you watch him, but he does like TV school. Uh, Great breakdowns. Definitely check him out. And he was watching this Jets offense, and he was like, this is a dinosaur offense. And the amount of times that they ran, and he referred to it as like the Greg Roman special, which I would anticipate a lot this week because it, it, I guess it's an attack cover three, which is the outside receiver has that must outside release go route, and then the mm-hmm. slot receiver runs that little uh, little out route to the flat, little five-yard out route. So okay. that that out that outside receiver takes the, the deep third with him, and then you hit the slot out. And I was watching the Chargers game. I was like, there's that Greg Roman special time in and time in, out. But they're playing cover two, though. That's and, then cover, I know. and then I was like, so what are you looking at on the tablet on the sideline? What is the point of the tablet if you're not going to adjust? It was <sighs> Like people, I, I, everybody, everybody wants to put the blame on Zach Wilson because he's yeah. clearly not good. And I probably, you know, I'm probably being too much of a fanboy a little bit to him. But I, I watch yeah. him. And it's like, okay, he's clearly better than he was last year, which last year was horrific. So mm-hmm. great, that's a low bar to clear. But he's not the biggest problem in this offense. Hackett is number one, which they're not going to revoke his play calling duties because that's just going to a- upset Aaron Rodgers. And then you're, know. you know, you could go to Todd Downing, who does have experience in, in Tennessee, but I just don't think that it's worth angering Rodgers. And then this offensive line has been. Horrific as well. Although Billy Turner is out for this week, and he was really the big problem last week. So we'll see what the yeah. offensive line looks like. It, if I had to guess, it would be Becton at left tackle, Lakin at left guard, who's one of the worst free agents. Uh, Douglas is offensive free agent. Uh, just so you, you know, I know you're not a, a Jets guy, so I'll, <laughs> I'll fill you in here. You're, here are Joe Douglas's offensive free agent signings just okay. in recent years. CJ Uzama, I don't have the contracts in front of you, but CJ Uzama for 
double digits. Yeah. Horrible. Uh, mm-hmm. Lakin Tomlinson, who we think he's getting paid $17 million a year. Horrible. Dalvin Cook at the end of, of August for $7 million, who's been horrible. <laughs> I mean, I, I seriously think I'm faster. Um, that's <laughs> hyperbole. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Lazard, who's been – he's been bad. He's just yeah. to be honest. He's been bad. Uh, I like Tyler Conklin is like the one free agent signing I feel like he's hit on on the offense side of the ball. The defense side of the ball, he's had a couple. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a couple other guys I'm missing there. But – the offensive side of the ball for the Jets is, is, has been awful. But I mentioned Todd Downing because he was with Tennessee in 2019. And that's – I was watching Tennessee 2019 film. Um, that's the what I think the Jets' offensive identity should try to be. Because all yeah. the Titans had was Derrick Henry and A.J. Brown. Jets had Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson. Titans mm-hmm. had a better offensive line. They had a better quarterback. But they ran the ball, and then they threw downfield, especially off play action. And so for the Jets going forward, I think they should try to get out of the mindset of, playing it safe, don't want to turn the ball over, let's let the defense win the win the game, throwing two yard routes to the flat and running oh, on second God. and eight. It's just throw down field. Throw down field and good things happen. Whether that's a PI or whether that's Zach Wilson who does have who does have a live arm. He can huck that thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Give him opportunities to throw down the field and maybe you'll create some big explosives. And if he if it gets picked off, you're punting anyways. So you know I, I feel like that's the future for this Jets offense is to try to set up some some downfield opportunities, and then the the con- the byproduct of that is that'll open up some of the things underneath because defenses right now are just crashing underneath. Like yeah. the Chargers, I mean, they were playing that cover too, and those, those yeah. press corners were just eating on the on the Jets flat routes and anything else that they try to do underneath. It was it's it's just been a nightmare season for the Jets offensively. But then you say that and you're like, all right, well they still are four and four. They are in the thick of things. If they could get a big win here against the Raiders, uh, I don't know how you're feeling about about this matchup. We, we do a couple of things. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll go through each roster where the okay. Jets are better, where the Raiders are better. Okay. Uh, we'll start with that. And it, it'll actually be nice to have somebody who can rep- accurately represent the other side of things. Cause typically okay. I'm very biased and I think I give every single one of the jets. And then Michael comes in as, you know, he's, he's the realistic one. He's like, oh, okay, no, probably the Raiders or that's a push. And you know, the saddest thing is, cause I was looking yeah. at beforehand trying to like pick, see who I pick. Aiden O'Connell is a fifth round rookie. Mm-hmm. And I seriously don't know if I can say Zach Wilson's better. Yeah, I, we can no, go no. push. We can go push. That's probably the what Michael and I would have done. I don't mm-hmm. know what you feel, but how sad is that? The Jets are the number two overall pick, third year in the league. Mm-hmm. And Aiden O'Connell, who's played in one game and is a fifth round rookie, you just don't feel like he or two games, and you don't feel like he can outbeat beat that guy out. It's just it's a sad state of affairs for the, for the Jets QB. Uh, see, see. I, I'm gonna go push here. I will. All right. E- even though I, I will say, just watching that Chargers game, I, I I felt bad for Zach Wilson because there's some times like there was just like a second and four. They just ran the ball right. They got six yards, and then he then he calls like all hitches or something against cover two. Yeah. And, then, and and then and then Zach Wilson has to pump. He has to like oh because if I throw it, I'm gonna throw an interception for sure. Yeah. Right. And they try to like, coach that out of him. No picks. Can't <laughs> can't have any interceptions. It's like. You're misusing the great defense. He can throw interceptions. This defense is going to hold the three or create their own turnovers. But exactly. And he had to force it to like a throw it to like a force of the running back or something. Yeah, like he's got the arm angles. At least he can yeah, throw a two-yard pass <laughs> with the horizontal arm angle. That's cool. Side arm. So, so I, I, I'm interested to see if he had like a better coordinator, what he would look like. That's yeah. kind of my thing. And, and, and that's going to be hard for like the jets and you know if they if he goes somewhere else and he looks better than he does oh, he now will. he will i've been saying that he's gonna be geno smith and everybody hates on me for saying that but i'm sorry like he's a he's definitely a late bloomer i mean maybe he'll be horrible whatever but yeah. like he's a late bloomer he's gotten a little bit better he's still horrible but mm-hmm. i shouldn't say horrible he's still bad last yeah. year he was horrible the thing I, I keep saying to jets fans though is they keep grading him on the scale of being the number two overall pick which he like he is and it's mm-hmm. totally fair jets fans are just upset because this was supposed to be the year with aaron Rodgers, super bowl hopes and now here we are watching zach wilson again who they benched last year they benched him twice last year mm-hmm. and the jets have i don't think the jets have hit on a a young quarterback my entire life i mean sanchez gino i guess gino maybe gino counts as a hit now uh yeah. darnold and wilson they've all been terrible in new york so i understand why jets fans are upset but yeah. Do you think that the Chiefs, if, if Mahomes went down, would be good with Blaine Gabbert? I mean, they have Andy Reid and they have some Travis Kelsey. And stuff, but, like, I think if I'm the Chiefs, I'd rather have Zach Wilson as my backup quarterback than Blaine Gabbert, as crazy yeah. as that might sound. Mm-hmm. Because at least Zach Wilson has a live arm. He does some good things every game. And then he does some bad th- His His main issue right now is just not throwing with anticipation. And yeah. he's, he's pretty much a two-read quarterback, which mm-hmm. is what they've kind of coached him into. It's like one, two, and then get to the check down or run. And so they've kind of they put the training wheels on him. 
but the key for him is, is in my opinion, is they have to kind of get back to what they were doing against the Chiefs, which is get him out of the pocket a little bit more, throw downfield, call the play aggressive, call the game aggressively. And if, if he goes two touchdowns and two interceptions, hey, that's two more touchdowns than the Jets are putting up right now. So it's like, I don't know. Sorry, I cut you off there. With, with, you're with good. You're time. good. I, I, you, you, I, I, so I, you're an outside perspective. How do you feel watching the Zach Wilson so far this season? I don't know how much you've watched, but yeah, I, I watched a couple games. You know, I, Zach, Zach's interesting because he does have a live arm, right? And you know, he can different. He can, he can move. There's a lot of things he can do. I, I just think you know, he, his pocket. He can move. He has legs. <laughs> yeah, he can move, right? And he uh, and, and I think that uh, one his issue coming out of college was always pocket presence, and I still think yeah. that's that's a problem, right? And when you have the scheme that he, that he's in. That when nobody's getting open, you're not scheming anybody open to help him out, and then he's going to hold the ball, and then and then he, he's not going to have that feel of the pressure coming around him. It's, it's not good. So I I think he's just he's not set up to be successful right now, but he's also not making up for it. Like some some quarterbacks that come in there and just make up for it, whatever the coordinator is messing him up. Even if they're young, they could find some way to make up for it. He's not he's not making up for Hackett at all. So the one thing yeah. they've done though is I do think they've done a better job with with him than LaFleur. Like I think LaFleur is a better offensive coordinator than Hackett, but at least under Hackett, and I don't know if it's maybe it's more downing, maybe it's Rogers over the offseason. But Wilson's first of all, the accuracy issues, he still missed a few throws here and there. But last year yeah. he was, I mean, he couldn't hit the ocean from the beach, which is the famous quote about Christian Hackenberg. He's now he at least can hit. You know, he's, he's not embarrassing his accuracy. In yeah. fact, he has some great he has some great balls. The other one is he finally steps up in the pocket. Like he, the pocket presence isn't great, like you mm -hmm. said. I mean, especially yeah. you saw it against the Chargers, and he's he's fumbled. A, he, I think he's eight fumbles, uh, not a loss, but the entire season he's eight fumbles. But he's finally stepping up into the pocket, and he's playing within the rhythm of the offense. Back foot hits, steps up, get rid of the ball. But yeah. the training wheels are clearly on him, and he's he, you can just see that he's so focused on not making the mistake. And that's leading to him not throwing with anticipation, not playing freely. And I understand not wanting to get him out of the pocket, out of structure too much, because that's where a lot of mistakes has happened when he just bails immediately. And then there's nobody on that side and he's throwing picks or he's running for two yards or whatever, but they have to get him outside of the pocket, let him play freer. Um, you know, these are all easy solutions for podcasters, but it does <laughs> yeah, seem like we're exactly. in 10 now. It's like, how is it's the same offense, but when you win, it's a great deodorant. But mm -hmm. you, you notice that Giants game and the Broncos game, and the Eagles game, it's still like they're getting away from what works so well against the Chiefs. And I don't know. I, I think I do think we'll see a little bit more of it against the Raiders. Um, yeah. All right. Keep going with the running backs. This is actually a okay. great, a great matchup before Josh Jacobs last game. I would have said a Brees Hall has been better this season. Josh yeah. Jacobs does have the resume though. He probably has the better offensive line, although we'll see about this one with, with no Colton Miller. Um, I'll go to you first. Who, who do you, who would you rather have Josh Jacobs or Brees Hall? Oh, man, that's tough. Whew. It could be another um, push. I'm going to go for now. I'll go Josh Jacobs just, okay. just because I, I think, you know, I think Brees Hall, I think he has uh, the elements to be as good as Josh Jacobs. I just think he's not there yet. And the, a lot of it is because of the offensive line that he's behind, but I think Josh Jacobs Jets is not fans behind. Just turn this podcast off. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but, <the> <laughs> I'm sure. But uh, when, uh, when, you know, Jacobs, he's, he has just like, I don't know. There's something about Jacobs. He could just make anything happen with a bad offensive line. Like last year, the offensive line was not good, in my opinion. A lot of people, I know there were some metrics that said they had some good run blockers. I watched it. It was all Josh Jacobs making people miss and getting extra 10 yards and doing all these crazy things that he's not doing this year. And you could see where he's not running for five yards per carry because last year he couldn't be tackled. Nobody could tackle him. A guy could be free. A free guy coming right at him, he's going to spin around, make that guy miss, and then get 10. And that's what he was doing last season. He's not doing this this year. So I still feel like as a uh, – and even maybe an o more overall running back, because I think Josh Jacobs has had a pretty good year blocking. He's had some great – he's a uh, pretty damn good as a receiver right now, and I think he's more of a third down back than he ever has been. So that's why I would go lean to Josh Jacobs, because I feel like even if he's not running the ball well, I could throw the ball to him. He could make a guy miss. He'll block for me and all those things. And I don't know if Bryce, Bryce – uh, Brees Hall Brees, is yeah. – yeah, if he's playing. It's confusing. We have Brees Hall, Bryce, Bryce Hall, Huff. Bryce Huff. <laughs> We got two Michael Carters. It's an announcer's it's, it's nightmare. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> I, receiver isn't particularly close, although Devontae Adams was nearly a jet if you listen to some of the reports this week. I yeah. wonder. I seriously do wonder what the package was. And then you look at the contract and like, how are they trading this guy? It does It does seem like potentially that could be a move in the offseason. I mean, we'll see what happens to the it Raiders. If, if the Raiders finish the season on a high note, and you know, I, I don't know if that'll happen because um, mm -hmm. you know Adams did 
it wasn't Adam, didn't Adams grow up a, a Raiders fan? I know he signed for Derek Carr. Yeah, he, he did. Grew he up did, a he fan. did. And yeah, Vegas, lower taxes. It's nice in the sun. So we'll see. That's no sure thing. But it wouldn't surprise me if the Jets did try to make a move to bring in a guy like Devontae Adams to, to pair him with Rodgers. But the guy that really jumped out to me was Jacoby Myers. I was watching him and I was just like, damn. I really wish the Jets gave him that contract over the offseason and just cut Corey Davis because he's exactly what they need. Um, yeah. And I don't know how the hell he got out of New England. Although, you know, probably just signed with McDaniels and I don't know if he was a realistic option for the Jets. But I was watching that Giants game. I was like, damn, Jacoby Myers is awesome. Yeah. So this one's not not close. This was definitely Raiders. I'll, I'll put push for running back because I would say Breeze. But, but yeah. quarterback and running back are push. Receiver, no question about it. The Jets just don't have the depth to compete with, with the Raiders. We have Hunter no. Renfro as, as the fourth receiver. And was it uh, Trey Tucker who had a – I think he had like one of the fastest plays last year or last yeah. week. He looked yeah, he's, insane. He's fast as hell. Yeah. So Raiders, it's, it's not even close. Tight end is uh, a little bit more interesting. You got – I mean, you, you tell – give me the scouting report of Michael Mayer. Okay. Apparently the Jets were interested in him in the draft and the, the Raiders took him. I love Tyler Conklin for the Jets, but then the Jets have this tight end, CJ Uzama. You know CJ Uzama is. And Mike, he's probably Michael's. I mean, between him or Dalvin Cook, Michael's public enemy number one. Uzama's <laughs> been absolutely dreadful for the Jets for two seasons now. He can't. Michael just thinks he's on a team because he dyes his hair and he pumps up the team and he seems like a hacket guy. The Jets okay. do have Jeremy Ruckert behind him, who's the third round pick from that 2022 class, which, by the way, I mean, I don't know if, you, I don't know if you've looked at it. That mm. might go down as one of the best Jets. It's definitely the best Jets draft class of all time. Oh, yeah. It's going to have, depending on how the next few years go, it could it could have a say for one of the best draft classes of all time. When you think of Sauce, Garrett, Jermaine Johnson, who's turned into an elite player, which he wasn't last year. Young young defensive linemen typically struggle. Shout out yeah. Tyree Wilson and, and Will McDonald. Uh, Reese Hall, Rucker, uh, Clemens, and then Max Mitchell, although Clemens has been pretty brutal this year. But, um, yeah. So the Jets tight end room as a whole – I do really like Uzama is a net negative though. He distracts every time he's on the field. How do you feel about this, this Raiders tight end room versus the jets? Uh, I think that it's a good tight end room. To be honest, I, I think it's, they, they block pretty well. I think also Hooper's actually showing guys a better blocker than I thought that he would. Michael Mary gets better as a blocker every single week. And I think he's, he hasn't even got a chance to showcase himself as a receiver really yet. Yeah. And I think that's where he is really special because, you know, one game he did, he had like five catches, 75 yards. The one game they did target him a lot and he was making guys miss in open field. He's a good yak guy. That's why I hope Aiden O'Connell leans on him a lot more for check downs because he could take a two yard check down and get 10. And that's what he does at tight end. He's hard to tackle. He'll run you over. He'll, run, he'll juke you. There's a lot of things he does in the open field that I think he has a chance to be really special. That's why I really like him because he has top five tight end, tight end potential. Certainly has league. the highest ceiling out of any guys listed here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think that you start to see it more every, every week, every week, because he's also getting better as a blocker, which I love that he just, he is getting so much better there because he was terrible in a preseason. And, then, <laughs> and now he's pretty, he's, he's pretty preseason decent. doesn't matter. Yeah, I remember, I remember matter. Jamar chase being terrible. And like, you blame <laughs> the stripes on the ball, not being there for dropping. And then everybody's like, this guy sucks. And then he's like one of the best regular receivers ever. Exactly. Preseason doesn't so, matter. Yeah, preseason doesn't matter at all. But you saw, you see him getting better there every week, and I really, I really like it there. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like this is a push because I don't think these tight end groups are like that stand out. You know what I mean? Right. Um, all right. Offensive tackle would very clearly be the Raiders if Colt Miller is playing. Without him, this is tough because I think Becton is definitely the best tackle in this game. I mean, you let me know, but I would say Becton without Colt Miller is the best tackle in this game. But then Max Mitchell on the other side who actually wasn't the Jets' biggest problem last week. He played guard last week, and honestly, Billy Turner was definitely the, the worst player on that line. And then I would probably say Lake and Tomlinson was the next worst. Mitchell yeah. looked all right at guard, but Mitchell as a whole is not very good. Um, so you got Becton at left tackle. I'm just assuming that's what the Jets are going to do. Becton at left tackle, Max Mitchell at right tackle. Okay. Becton, it, it, Becton is, is definitely developed into that player that you thought he could be as a rookie. He's stayed healthy, knock on wood. He's been like the only Jets offensive line that has stayed healthy, knock on wood. Um, but how do you think he compares to these these Raiders backup uh, tackles? Yeah, I think it's, it's I think it's a push again. Um, right. I, 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 you know, even even with that, because you know Mumford, he, he, even when he hasn't played like a full game yet this season, they do, do a little weird rotation thing. So it's gonna be interesting to see how he plays. I kind of want to see him play a full game first before I even try to say that somebody's better than somebody else. I think Illuminor is just a solid uh, tackle. I don't know how he's gonna look on the left side though. So I don't know if he's played left. I don't. I hope they don't play Brandon Parker. I pray to God they don't play Brandon Parker left tackle. So uh, that's what I'm doing, you know, in my uh, at night because they re-signed him, and I'm sure every Raiders fan will be terrified if he suits up and he's active. So if Especially hopefully he doesn't play left tackle, 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So hopefully he doesn't suit up at left tackle. I'm hoping. Um, but you know, I think this is a push to there too as well. Okay. I struggle with the interior offensive line giving it to a unit with Greg Van Roden, but he has <laughs> definitely been better with the Jets have had with Lake and Tomlinson this year. It's just hard to debate. Joe Tipman is the one plus guy that the Jets do have in the interior. And it does seem like the Jets might play Xavier Newman, who's only played against the Giants. He was brought up off the practice squad, played guard for like a series, and then never played center before and had to play center uh, uh, against against the Giants after the Jets lost all their centers. And he actually, you know, he had a tough start, but he settled in all right. I think it's going to be Newman. They did bring in Roger Saffold. So I don't exactly know what this Jets interior is going to look like. There's also some rumblings that maybe the Jets will try to play Titman at guard. So against Max Crosby, they can give Max Mitchell some help, which does mm-hmm. kind of make sense. Um, and play Newman at center, which he, you know, he did settle in against the Giants. They they got that. I don't know if you watched the game, but hopefully yeah. you didn't. But they they spiked <laughs> the ball with one second, and that was a lot of that had to do with Newman getting up there and uh, spotting the ball. So he's he's at least done it a little bit. I don't know exactly what this interior is going to look like. I struggle giving it to the Raiders with Greg Van Roten, but it's hard to debate the numbers. So I, yeah. I think this has to be the Raiders. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think you have to go with the Raiders because I think Dylan Parham is uh, has a chance to be a really good guard, and uh, he hasn't really struggled that much in pass protection this year. Run game, there's some insists just because he hasn't played strip issues, and I think he's more of a finesse tackle, more of a pass blocking uh, guard. I mean, and you know he could play in different positions and stuff like that. He could play center as well, just in case Andre James goes down, he can move to center, and he's a very versatile guy. And I think he's very strong in pass protection, and I think the inside they have a lot, they have pretty good communication. Recently, they've been able to, you know, work stunts. You know, you talk about the Jets running a lot of stunts. That's where they're going to be tested a little bit this week. And but I think they have good communication, especially. You know, Colt Miller's out, and that's a big deal because Parham and Colt Miller look worked excellent together on the left side, and um, that's going to be a big deal for them. But I still think interior wise on the offensive line, I think that it will be the Raiders for sure. All right, this has been uh, quite ugly when you look at the Jets' offense. So far, it's two for the Raiders, receiver and interior offensive line, and then we went pushed QB running back tight end offensive tackle, although you would have given the Raiders running back. Either way, it's you know not bad with the Jets and Brees. But the defense, <laughs> the defensive side of the ball is where the Jets should make up for it. The, only, the one that's interesting is Edge, because Max Crosby is so damn good. But the Jets yeah. do have... The Jets do have Bryce Huff. Jermaine Johnson's really coming to his own. John Franklin Myers is a fantastic player. They do have guys like Carl Lawson and Will McDonald, the rookie. So this is a very, very good Jets edge group and a really deep group. They rotate them constantly. They basically are 10 deep. I could throw Clemens in there as well. Um, so I, I definitely depth wise, I'd give it to the Jets, but Max Crosby is so damn good. Yeah. They have Tyree Wilson, who's starting to come on. He looked a lot better against the Jets. Well, I don't know if he looked a lot better, but he looked pretty solid against the Giants. Yeah. Um, and then Koontz on the other side as well. How do you feel about the edge, the edge rushers uh, in this one? Is this another push, or is the, do the Jets finally get on the board here with their first one? Yeah, I think the Jets get on the board just because okay. they have they have more guys that are That's dangerous. Was, <laughs> I didn't, didn't want to offend you with with because Max Crosby's so damn good. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Ma- Max is, is so damn good. Um, you know, but I still think the edges will definitely go to the Jets just because they have more better rotation. I mean, there's a reason why Max plays every snap. You know, yeah. Um, that's for a reason is because really they can't have him off the field. And you know the, the Jets, they have they can have the luxury. Of having have, right. Yeah. I, what, what was the Vegas line for Max Crosby sacks this week? Do we know? Maybe I should look I that up. If it's two and a half, <laughs> take the over. Honestly, I think I think he has three sacks against the Jets this week. Yeah, yeah, because he's playing out of his two. mind. Yeah. He's playing out of his two. mind. So so if, since he's playing out of his mind, yeah, they're, they're, it could look equal. But I think overall, if I per, me personally, I would rather have the Jets rotation with Max Crosby. Then, then, then not then just having hey, Max maybe Crosby maybe Will McDonald guys. can develop. Will McDonald's come under a lot of fire this week, because, even though he had his first sack and a strip sack against against yeah. the Chargers. But you know, young defensive linemen typically typically take a year. I remember Quentin Williams getting a lot of hate his rookie year because he didn't really do yeah. anything. So mm-hmm. it's a, and Jermaine Johnson last year didn't really do much. So it's it's really you, you can't really judge these guys until year two or year three for the young defensive linemen. But the Jets took Will McDonald. Presumably, because the, the rumor was because they wanted off to tackle, the Patriots jump them, and the Steelers take Broderick Jones, um, or the pa- Patriots take down, and the Steelers jump up for, for Broderick Jones. So maybe the Jets would have taken off to tackle, which would have been nice. The Jets go ahead, instead take the best player on the board, Will McDonald, but they left a lot of receivers on the board who are doing work. And then you look at this Jets receiver room, and it's like, it'd be pretty nice to have a Jordan Addison right now, or a Jackson Smith and Jigba, or a Zay Flowers, or, or one of those guys. But I do believe in Will McDonald, and I do think that Max Crosby is a guy you can look at as maybe a guy. Will I mean, Crosby's like 
cream of the crop, but maybe a guy yeah. McDonald can, can develop into it with his physical traits. Uh, interior defensive line, this one, sorry, is pretty pretty obviously the Jets with, with yeah, Cameron yeah. Too. I mean, to be also, honest, you can go all the rest of these just Jets. Yeah, I know. I was – we have to go. <laughs> Interior defensive line, <laughs> linebacker, corner. corner. Safety would be the only one that I could maybe make an argument for the for the Raiders. I don't know how you know <laughs> I was, I was, thinking, I was thinking this whole time, like, if you go defense, man. It's just, it's just, yeah. It's just, I, offense yeah. was definitely going to be the Raiders, but how do you feel about the safeties? Jets have Tony Adams and, and Jordan Whitehead who, you know, they are, be, are the benefactors of the Jets having elite, elite cornerback play. I mean, all three guys that the Jets play on, on that corner are unbelievable, and they have a great pass rush. So these safeties yeah. aren't tested too much. Whitehead makes you know a play every game. Tony Adams had the game-winning interception against the Eagles, um, but he's an undrafted free agent. How do you feel, feel like the Raiders' safeties have played this uh, this year? To be honest, I, I think that might be the only push on defense because I think the okay. Raiders' safeties are pretty. I was right? Trayvon, yeah yeah. Trayvon Morag has, has is playing. Uh, he's definitely have a career year. Marcus Epps. Uh, I think he's made a, had a, made a big deal. The really, Raiders haven't given up a lot of huge plays. I mean, that's one thing they haven't done, especially in the past game, is give up explosive plays, and I think it's because of those two. And, you know, Morik has a couple picks this year. Um, you know, he has made some great tackles. He has a pretty pretty damn good games. And, you know, same thing with Marcus Epps. I think they've they, they played pretty well over there. They play a lot of three safeties, too. They got, my, uh, you know, Isaiah Palomau, uh, who's, who plays out there, too, as well. He gets a little mixed in there. He, he went to my high school, so I always shot him out. But, uh, nice. um, yeah, so he, he – is somebody that's coming up and they, they went a lot more three safeties this past week. You know, they had Paul Mao sometimes running free safety and then have more and Epps up, up, up front and then kind of mixing it up with those guys. So I think Trayvon Morag and Epps and some of the safeties around there, they're, they're, that's probably the Raiders best group in the secondary. And honestly, to me, that's the best group on the defense. So uh, that's why I would say it was a little bit of a push there. Because, All right, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Cause if the jets had Trayvon Morag, they'd probably be like ridiculous. So yeah. Hey, we, we got Ashton Davis as our third safety. They've, they've been playing a lot more big nickel with Davis yeah. and they have, a, they have Adrian Amos as well, but you know, clearly the safety is, is are the weak link of this, of this jets defense. But at the same time, they have not been bad this year. Outside of the first few weeks, there are some miscommunications uh, in the backfield. May, there haven't really been any in the last few weeks, but maybe the Raiders can capitalize on something like that. But really, I mean, when you look at the jets, this jets defense from the defensive line to the linebackers, which we didn't talk about, but the jets linebackers right now, especially Quincy Williams oh, yeah, are playing yeah. at an unbelievable level. <laughs> it's not even close. Anyway, get, get ready for some uppercuts. That's his big sell. We got a few celebrations. We got Quincy Williams uppercut. We've got uh Jermaine Johnson's like, it's like, a, I think it's an FSU thing, but I call it like the <laughs> Thor hammer. He lifts his arm up and then, the, you know, comes down and yeah. then we've got Bryce Huff has this little waddle celebration. So we've got some, some celebrations. Does Max Crosby have a, uh, uh no, 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 just, I'm him and patting his chest. Yeah. <laughs> he acts like he's been there before. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, so the final tally was, uh, jets four with the edge into, I mean, the entire defense outside of safety, the Raiders mm-hmm. two with receiver interior offensive line, although you might give him running back and we did push at QB running back tight end offensive tackle and safety. Yeah. That is the story with this matchup is, is the two, the two defenses. Uh, obviously, this Jets defense has been playing at an elite, elite level. I wonder how many teams in NFL history have had. We'll see how this this ends up working out at the end of the season. But the best defense in the league, and then the worst offense in the league, because that's really what the Jets are heading towards. Uh, yeah. yeah, the midpoint of the season. Uh, the Raiders defense played certainly inspired last week. A few more things here, then we'll get out of here. Uh, I forgot yeah. to do it before the, we broke down, but uh, a key matchup on on for the, the Raiders' offense versus the Jets' defense, then a key matchup on on the flip side of things. Do you, do you have one that that you're uh, that you're thinking of that can help decide this game for from either perspective, Raiders or Jets? Yeah, honestly, I think it's uh, a key matchup. You know that you know I want to call out is the linebackers versus tight ends because I think that's what the Raiders are going to attack. I mean, I don't think they're going to attack outside that much. I think they're going to try to stay away from those guys as much as possible, especially with Aiden O'Connell strength to throw to the middle of the field. I think we're going to see how those, you know, they're going to try to attack those linebackers because even, you know, a good CJ Mosley is, you know, his thing is more kind of playing the run than, and just being a playmaker than actually kind of guarding somebody one-on-one. So I think they're going to try to attack him a little bit. Um, you know, Quincy Williams, I'm, I'm not, I, he's just a little, he's just kind of awesome. But I think CJ Mosley has a little bit of cracks and maybe some things you could attack a little bit against him. So I think that's where they're going to go and try to attack inside, especially with like even moving Adams inside and, a lot of those guys, because I know Sauce and them don't move around that much. So they're going to try to move these guys around, and I think that's what they're going to do. They're going to try to attack inside. So we're going to see how good those uh, um, Jets linebackers can cover a little bit. But I, I think it, 
I think they're going to be ready for the challenge, but I think that's going to be the yeah. Raiders' kind of best matchup. Will, I have to say, and somehow I've lost the video. I don't know. How, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry for those <laughs> watching on YouTube. It's just the logo <laughs> at this point, which was the only video we used to use. So I guess they're used yeah. to it. But Quincy Williams okay. has been fantastic in coverage, and that was one of the, the few criticisms I had of this Jets defense last week. And it's like the only thing you could say um, was there was a key third down right after the Jets' second fumble in the game, and they went dime. They brought Brandon Eccles in the game, and they took Quincy Williams out and left Mosley in. And it ended up with Mosley on Eckler, and, and Herbert was able to get out of a sack, and, and Eckler was able to get away from Mosley. It was a big gain, and the Raiders ended up scoring a touchdown on the drive. So I was furious about that because it's like, if you're going to go dime, keep Quincy Mosley or keep Quincy Williams in the game because he's been unbelievable uh, covering receivers, tight ends, running backs. I mean, the Jets asked him to do it all. So I feel yeah. good about, about the Jets' chances in that matchup. Uh, I think the, the, the one thing for, for me – uh, with this Raiders offense versus Jets defense is just that the Raiders taking advantage of kind of what we were talking about with the, with the, the screen play. There was a one play in this game where Eckler actually ended up dropping it. I think it was on a third down, but the, the Chargers had had a huge gain on the screen. The Jets have had some troubles um, with the screen. So I don't know if this is necessarily a matchup, but Williams and, and on Jacobs, uh, actually I think it's more so Whitehead on Jacobs in, in the screen game. Sometimes that's kind yeah. of what ends up happening, especially if Williams goes with the tight end. Uh, that screen game for the Raiders, I feel like, could be uh, could be a, a huge opportunity for them to to get some sort of yards. Although I do anticipate a, a low scoring affair. On the flip side of things, this Jets offense versus Raiders defense. I mean, the key the key matchup is Max Mitchell versus Max Crosby, which maybe yeah, yeah. isn't even a key matchup because it's going to be domination. But it's how do the Jets handle it with keeping tight ends in? I hope to for the love of God, it's not Uzama. He will not be able. He, he's uh, even you know, he, had, he gave up a sack last week where he had help, I think, with Rucker, and he allowed the sack anyways in the inside. So for the Jets, I think obviously chipping Max Crosby is going to be huge. I think it, if it's if it's Conklin, who's actually a pretty good pass blocker, or Rucker, you're not going to be able to stop him, but they can at least hopefully mitigate it because Max Mitchell yeah. against against Max Crosby is going to is going to be a nightmare match. Do you have anything on that side of the ball that you're looking forward to outside of Crosby dominating Max Mitchell for for an hour? Yeah, I'm interested in how they try to stop uh, Garrett Wilson. I, I'm, I'm kind of yeah. interested in that because, you know, the Ra to be honest, the Raiders haven't been tested outside that much. And I, I, it's some this games, isn't the week that this is not the I, week that they're going to be. But I, I know, but it's, it's just it, it's interesting to me that they haven't been right. I mean, Marcus Peters about him. He's been chilling half the time. That's why he doesn't come up and tackle. He's probably been just eating sandwiches over there because nobody's testing. Him, <laughs> right. So so um, it's, I, I still think they're going to try to test those guys a little bit. And, you know, uh, just because, just you know, Garrett Wilson's probably the only guy out there that can really affect the Raiders. I'm interested to see what that matchup is because, you know, Max Max is going to win. You know, I'm, I'm not worried about Max. Max is going to – even if you double-team him, he's going to – he's he's so willed that, you know, it's going to be all game. He's coming. It's not like just one matchup. <laughs> one snap. He's coming for 70 snaps, just every single snap. And it's the same velocity, same speed every single time. So, yeah, it's going to be a fun day for whoever that right tackle is. Whoever's chipping him, it's going to be a fun day for them too. So – um, I think the matchup is going to be, you know, how the Raiders can control Garrett Wilson, because if Garrett Wilson goes off and <laughs> the Raiders make Zach Wilson look good, like they did Tyson Badgett, it's, it's not going to be a good day. So, uh, all right. The other thing we do is we pick a, cause we, uh, the podcast for, for one of the podcasts for Jets X Factor, we choose an X Factor for this game, similar to the matchup, but like the one player. I guess you could give it from the Raiders' perspective. Usually it's a, mm. a different Jets player. We've been pretty on the money. I mean, my predictions have been horrible this year. I think All Michael right. is 7-1, is and one actually, and I'm 4-4. <laughs> and four and four. Um, So I'm like the Jets, I guess. But my okay. X-Factors have been pretty on the money. Last week I chose Lazard, and he was a huge X-Factor in, in terms of the biggest difference between the Jets playing well and, and playing poorly. So I guess you can give the Raiders X-Factor. For me, the big Jets X-Factor for this game, Mekhi Beckton. I think the Jets are going to need a big run to the left, especially on the outside. And getting Becton out in space against this Raiders defense on the outside is is going to be an opportunity for the Jets to have a, at least a few – sorry, at least one, if not a few, big runs to the left. And I think Becton is a guy that the Jets are going to really have to lean on uh, to create some offensive production. So my X factor for this week is, is Mekhi Becton. Marcus, from the Raiders' perspective, who is the X factor, the biggest difference for the Raiders having a good game and a bad game? If you had to choose one player, who would it be this week? I think it's Hunter Renfro. And uh, yeah. I, I wow. think, I, I think, Interesting. I think okay. he could be X factor because like I said, I think they're going to try to attack the middle of the field. And I think he's going to have a big factor in that. And, you know, I talked about Michael Mayer a little bit, but even Hunter Renfro, I think he's going to have a, a good chance to really get some catches. It might not be a lot of yards, but to kind of move the chains and get back into that mode. Cause he, I mean, he had two first downs last week and that's they call him third Renfro. 
And I really expect him to kind of be an X factor in this game inside, you know, because they are going to try to attack inside and move these guys around and try to get away from Sauce Gardner and those guys. Hey, and beware, Mark, beware Michael Carter the second, though. He's, he's I, I, the I, best I, nickel I, in the league. <laughs> I know, I know that. I know that. But, you know, I, th I think there's going to be a good chance to can move Renfro around and try to figure out how to, um, you know, get get him the ball and he can make guys miss and stuff like that. I think he's a little bit of an X factor in this game. All right. Um, trying to think. Oh, last thing. OK, sorry. Last thing in the predictions, we have okay. uh, one random prediction. So you can go an offensive random prediction and a defensive okay. random prediction and then the score prediction. We'll get to the score in a second. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. The, and Michael goes so hyper specific on this. For instance, his last week was a Michael Clemens block field goal and a Zach Wilson rushing touchdown. Obviously, none of that happened. I had Mosley force fumble, which the, uh, we were talking about the fumbles in the preview pod. There were plenty of them. The Jets just couldn't fall on any of them. And Lazard deep ball, which they did try, but Lazard just didn't want to high point it for whatever reason. Um, so, do you have a random prediction uh, on the offense side of the ball and the defense side of the ball? Uh, random prediction. Let me see. You know, I, can, I can give you one. I, I think okay, uh, uh, just like while you think, I'll give you one. Okay. Uh, I'll say, I mean, I think Brees Hall has a 50 yard run on the left side. I think 50 yards plus. I think he's going to have a huge, uh, a huge run. He's had some big explosive plays this year, but I think one of them is going to come against the Raiders down that left sideline. So that's, that's my offensive random prediction. Uh, my random, okay. One. Okay. My random prediction is that Michael Mayer leads the Raiders in yards. Okay. Okay. I like that. Uh, I'm writing them down. Okay. Um, and then do you have one for the Raiders defense? Uh, Raiders defense. I'm going to go Max Crosby has five sacks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Honestly, he might. He might. The that's that's my be, random prediction. There you go. The Jets better be triple teaming and Max Crosby five sacks. Wow. Take the over on Crosby sack. I really do want – I should look it up, but, you know, somebody can comment it. Um, <laughs> the Jets defense, though. You know what I'll say? I'll say Sauce Gardner gets his first interception of the season. Okay. Yes, he has, he's not had him. Quinnen has 0.5 sacks. Sauce has no interceptions. These, these guys got to get on the on the scoreboard. So I'll add that. Sauce Gardner gets his first uh, interception, and Quinnen Williams gets his first full sack. Those, those are my random predictions. Then last thing, Marcus, I promise. I know we, we've went longer than I thought we would. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, score prediction. How do you think this one goes to the rear? I think this is going to be an ugly defensive battle. Uh, who do you see coming out on top here? Um, You know – I think the Jets probably end up winning this game because I, I just think I don't know. I think Ian O'Connor's gonna have a uh, welcome. Welcome. He, he kind of had a welcome to the NFL moment with the Chargers. I think it's really gonna happen this game. So um, especially yeah. with Colt Miller out, man, I just don't feel very comfortable about it. So you know, I, I think the Jets are gonna pull this one ugly as hell, right? Like like a sixteen to thirteen, and you know, something stupid <laughs> like that. Something, That'd be something nobody wants to watch. This season, honestly. <laughs> Something nobody wants to watch on Sunday Night Football. Let's yeah, just say that. I know. I have the primetime slate this week. Michael's prediction is he texted me. He just texted me. Okay. He said, My prediction is Jets. And by the way, Michael's seven and one. So he's the only oh. prediction anybody should honestly be listening to. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, uh, well, yeah. Hey, you, we, won't, we don't know your record yet. My record is four and four. <laughs> My record is just nothing. I think I picked the Jets in every game except the. Uh, Except the Eagles game, which they won, so okay. everybody can ignore my prediction. But Michael's prediction is Jets twenty three, Raiders thirteen, and I I do agree. I I don't think the Jets have maybe the uh, offensive performance that's going to satisfy everybody on on Jets Twitter. I still think that the Raiders are going to make some plays. Um, I, I think it's going to be the Brees Hall show. I do think I I th figured maybe I should try this for the random prediction, but you know what? I'm just going to bet on Brees Hall. But I do think the Jets are going to have a play action deep shot as well. Uh, in this mm -hmm. game, I think they're going to try to take some shots down the field. It could lead to Zach Wilson throwing some interceptions, but hey, you have this Jets defense to hold a rookie quarterback missing his, his starting left tackle um, to at least a field goal, if not punts, turnovers, and, and whatnot. I think the Jets win this. I agree with you. I think it's going to be pretty low scoring. Michael said 23 13. I'll say 20 to, man, I'll go, I'll go 17 to 3. How about that? Sorry, okay. Raiders. Sorry, Raiders right. fans. I mean, that's not crazy to me, to be honest, with, that, with the way this game might go. So, But I do – hey, I like Antonio Pierce. I like the outlook um, for, for the Raiders. I mean, certainly better than than Josh McDaniels. Um, I mean, that's – I don't know how he got a job. Technically for the third time because I guess the Colts hired him too and fired him. Yeah. Um, all right, that's going to do it for us. Uh, Marcus, where, where can the people find you? Because not only do you the, do the Raiders, I mean, you can give all the plugs, but you're yeah. a great uh, voice to follow on NFL Twitter for breaking down quarterbacks, breaking down film. You're a smart NFL mind. So tell our listeners where they can find you, find your work and, and follow you on Twitter. Yeah, so follow me on Twitter at the Mark John NFL. Uh, of course, go to Tape Don't Lie. If you guys you know enjoy this preview, me and uh, my uh, co-host Matt Holder, we're going to be doing a preview of the Jets tomorrow. So 
go check that out. It's going to be all film preview, you know, going over how we think the Raiders can stop them or, you know, what their weaknesses are or whatever, what their strengths are. We do that every single week. So check that out tomorrow. And then, um, you know, I got a quarterback podcast called A Little Pocket Awareness. Check that out as well. I go over quarterbacks and talk about a whole bunch of stuff, all quarterbacks on that one. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's mostly it. And, of course, silverblackpride.com, but I'm not sure Jets fans don't want to read <laughs> stuff. But, you know, I'm, I'm there too, you know. But, like, uh, for Taped Online, we're, we're, we do a whole bunch of draft stuff. So that's that's kind of the difference. You like the draft. We might go over somebody that just drafted, you know, I, you know, or something like that or, you know, those type of players. And so, you know, come check us out over there. Uh, all right, Marcus, uh, you can follow us at 2 Pod on Twitter. Myself, Ben W. Blessington. I'll give Michael. I mean, everybody follows Michael anyway. He's pushing 40,000 followers. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I'm Michael underscore well, Nania. Like balling, bro. Like, I know. I know. That Twitter blue check is like, I mean, it's only like 13 bucks a month. I know people will criticize him sometimes and be like, you're doing this for, for Twitter money. It's like they don't know he can buy himself like a Chipotle burrito with the money he gets every month. This is nothing. It's nothing to Michael Nania. Uh, but you go to JetsXFactor.com, best place to go for, for Jets content. <laughs> Uh, subscribe to the other Jets X Factor pods. Subscribe to the Jets X Factor YouTube. If you can, rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. That'll do it for us. Marcus, thank you so much. Really appreciate you filling in here for, for Michael. You gave some great Raiders insight. Michael and I will both be there. So our our post-game pod will probably come out probably come out Monday, depending on flights. could be Tuesday morning. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Really appreciate it. Again, Marcus, thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend. Go Jets.